want you to listen to three Bible texts. We'll turn to some other Bible texts as we go, but if you just want to listen to these words with the best concentration you can possibly muster with the Spirit of God's help. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as preached in my gospel. Such clear words. Such important words, gospel words. And yet, I would suggest to you men that there is a real jeopardy in relationship to the gospel itself. That we lose sight of what the gospel really is, that we lose sight of what the gospel really does, And that the great jeopardy is not outside places like this. It's not outside of evangelicalism. One great jeopardy for us of losing sight of and understanding the gospel is actually an internal jeopardy. It's actually within evangelicalism, something that we're a part of. And so that's what we're going to talk about tonight. We're going to talk about some awful gospel-related missteps that jeopardize the most important thing in the whole world, the most important thing that's central to all ministry, the good news of salvation in Christ. Now, what I don't want to do is sound like I'm some sort of fundamentalist ranting and raving and angry about good news. I acknowledge, uh, hello, my name is Pat, and you're supposed to say, Hello, Pat. I am a recovering fundamentalist, okay? Uh, and so I'm glad we're having a meeting. Um, so, <laughs> but here we are, and we need to be serious, sober-minded, thoughtful, but motivated about clarity when it comes to the good news about Jesus Christ, because in so many ways, it's everything. And if there are gospel missteps that maybe we're taking or are prone to take, We need to take those to heart. And I love addressing you men because men are to act like men and be bold and courageous. And we want to lead. We want to lead when it comes to the most important thing in the whole world. And that's the good news about salvation in Jesus Christ. The gospel is this. The good news that Jesus Christ did it all. That Jesus Christ perfectly fulfilled God's law. That He did everything right as one of us, as a human being. And then, having done nothing wrong, He went to... Looking for a cross. (laughs) Thank you. The pulpit used to be over there, so I'll give a little latitude. (laughs) He went to the cross. He went to the cross and, and He went there as if He'd done everything wrong. Everything that we've done wrong. And He atoned for our trespasses, for our sins, our violations against God's law, having Himself kept that law perfectly on our behalf. And then what? Gloriously, victoriously raised from the dead so that we might have new life also. It's good news. Now, we could focus on one of those aspects. We'll talk about all of those aspects in one way or another, but it's the good news of salvation in Christ, right? Let's pretend like we're Baptists. We say amen to this. We say we agree with this. This is right. And so we'll talk about some missteps. We don't lose sight of the the, the great news that is the gospel. It is really why we're here. It's why a church exists. It's why we worship and praise God. And I have more missteps written down here than we'll cover. Um, But we'll certainly look at at least at a handful of these in our time together in this session. Number one, abusive gospel misstep number one, if you're going to take some notes. Abusive gospel misstep number one. And some of these are going to be like bumper sticker slogans. Some of these are not going to be. This is one of those bumper sticker slogan kinds of gospel missteps. 
Perhaps you've heard it before. Justification means just as if I've never sinned. Just as if I never sinned. That's a gospel misstep. Okay? I'm not sure where it came from. Some evangelical folklore uh, where we've been trained to be Sunday school teachers and we're taught when we teach kids concepts or adults concepts, we're going to teach them the justification. That Bible word means just as if I never sinned. Evangelical folklore that came secretly from the devil originally because it's a gospel misstep. It's not true. That's not what justification means. And so in one sense, I want to have an altar call for all of you men uh, who've ever taught that in a class and we're going to come forward in a good Finney-esque kind of way and you're going to have a repentance at the altar up here that we don't have. Um, but we won't do that because we don't want to fall on our swords. Uh, I, all of us are guilty of believing wrong things and teaching wrong things at one time or another. And uh, if we were going to have an altar call, I'd want you to come forward and say, I confess my sin. I'll never do that again. But I need to prove it to you first. Justification is this in a nutshell. Justification, that, that, that legal word, legal idea, that forensic reality, that you being a sinner are declared righteous even though you're not. You are declared a perfect law keeper because that word righteous has to do with law. You as a violator of God's holy law are declared a law keeper even though you're not based upon the perfect law keeping of Christ. Right? Christ's perfect work on behalf of everyone who would ever believe is credited. It is imputed and based upon his perfect law keeping obedience credited to you by faith, God declares you a perfect law keeper, is the idea. Even though you know and I know we're actually what? Lawbreakers. We're sinners. Sin is lawlessness, 1 John says. And so we're, we're, we've all sinned and we're, we're all uh, lawless in that sense. That's what justification is. It's important that we remember that. In a minute, we're going to go to Romans 4 and Philippians chapter 3 to see these ideas or these realities. But think with me about this. If justification is, this is the wrong idea, this is the gospel misstep, just as if I never sinned, where, where does that bring me spiritually? Spiritually, it brings me to zero. Okay? It brings me to zero. Just as if I never sinned. So now I, I'm at a big zero. And God requires zero from all of us, right? Wrong. He doesn't require zero from us. What does God require? He requires perfection. Jesus himself in the Sermon on the Mount said, be perfect. That's what's, that's what's required. What's, what's God's law in summary? What does God require? Matthew 22, Jesus summarizes the law. What does he say? The law of God is that you be a spiritual zero and God will take you. All you have to do is uh, just do whatever you want to do and ignore God. Now, now the idea is, well, the reality is, he says, love the Lord your God, how? With all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength, with all of your might. The idea is all of your faculties, all of the time, including your motives. Just treat God like he's God. Do all the right things all of the time. Oh, and while you're at it, <laughs> love your neighbor as yourself. There's a summary of the whole law. Just as if I never sinned. Just as if I never sinned isn't a good definition at all. How about this? I'm going to suggest this. It doesn't work on a bumper sticker or teacher training class unless you're serious. Justification, better to say, just as if I never sinned. That's important, by the way. And just as if I perfectly kept God's holy law all of the time, right? Just as if I loved God with my heart, soul, mind, and strength, and my neighbor as myself perfectly, even with motives all the time. Now I realize you, there could be overlap in what sin is, but the reality is that it's what, you're, it, it, it's what you don't do and what you do, and it's both. That's what God requires. And now it's so much richer, isn't it? What did Christ do? What Christ did was he atoned for our rebellion, yes, but he also positively earned for us this right standing before God. 
Let's go ahead and look at, at Romans chapter 4, verse 5, so we can see justification in this reality. Then Philippians chapter 3. But God doesn't require zero on the ledger. Zero will send us to hell. We don't want zero that sends us to hell. We actually want the positive side, not just the, the removal of the guilt, but actually the crediting of the positive. So in Romans chapter 4, verse 5, in so many ways you could pick just about anywhere in Romans, but Romans 4, 5, because it's a classic text, says, and to the one who does not work, but believes or trusts or has faith in him, that would be Christ, who justifies, who declares righteous, who declares a law keeper, is the idea, the ungodly, his faith, faith in Christ in our context, uh, is counted or credited as righteousness. And righteousness and, and justice and justify the related words, the idea is essentially he's getting at the same idea, the same reality. It's a great, awesome reality. By faith, when you trust in Christ, you're not only receiving removal of guilt, forgiveness, if you will, you're also receiving his perfect law keeping credited to your account. So now when Pat look, or when God looks at Pat, a sinner, an ungodly person, like Romans 4 says, or you, he says, you're righteous in my eyes. And if you and I are honest, we say, but we're not righteous. Righteous in my eyes based upon what? Yes, Christ's righteousness, because he does it on our behalf. It's extraordinary. How about Philippians chapter 3, just to get another sample. Philippians chapter 3, verse 9. The Apostle Paul is talking about the same uh, reality about Christ's great work and uh, Christ's great righteousness credited to us. And it says in verse 9, and to be found in him, to be found in Christ, not having a righteousness, not having a law keeping of my own that comes from the law and his own efforting is the idea, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God. Theologians talk about the alien righteousness, and it is alien because it's not ours. It comes from God that depends on faith and not faith in faith. To, to look at the greater context, he's talking about faith in what? Faith in Christ. Faith in whom really would be the right idea? Christ's righteousness credited to us. Remember some wise Bible teacher once said, the doctrine upon which the church stands or falls is the doctrine of, anybody know Latin to be fancy? Let's really show what we know. Sola fide, right? Faith alone. And what he meant was faith alone in Christ alone in his perfect work. The doctrine upon which the church stands or falls? And, and, and we're getting it wrong because we're trying to be simple? Let's not get it wrong. Let's be clear and, and let's give Christ even more glory than he would otherwise get. And, and not just saying he takes our, our sin away. That's awesome and should be emphasized. But he not only takes our sin, our guilt away, he gives us that positive righteousness because he himself positively kept the law for us. Which is going to give Christ more glory, exaltation, and praise. If we see him for the, for, for the full Savior that he is. And so that just stokes up the fires of praise. And we understand that he's not this half a, a half a savior. He's a full savior. He does everything necessary. And I so love to worship him as a result of that and be thankful to him for that. If that's the doctrine upon which, which the church stands or falls, and I think there's good insight in that, that, that would be important for us. It's better than we might have even imagined. Just as if I'd perfectly obeyed the law of God. Let's move on to another gospel misstep, an abusive gospel misstep. Perhaps you've heard this one before. Preach the gospel at all times, and if necessary, what? Use words. Use words. You guys hang out in the same bad places I hang out. <laughs> That one is so trendy. When I was working on this message, I was sitting at a Starbucks and there were some local youth workers uh, at, a, at a big evangelical mega church just across the street from the Starbucks where I was see, sit, sitting. And I kid you not, I was working on this message and they were talking about that. And they were doting over it. What a great philosophy of youth ministry it is and how awesome this is. And it was just blowing my mind. I thank God for the bad providence, as the Puritans would say. <laughs> or maybe the good providence. Preach the gospel at all times and when necessary, use words. You know, oh, that's so good, that's so awesome. 
Well, we don't know exactly where that came from. Usually it's attributed to St. Francis of Assisi. Um, we don't know for sure, um, but I'll reference it in relationship to him. And I would just encourage you to maybe remember it this way. If it's true. St. Francis as a sissy. That's sissy evangelism. Okay? It's bad. It's bad. Now, sometimes it goes under other guises that are related. Deeds, not creeds. Right? Sometimes we want to put it that way. Or incarnate ministry. That's really cool right now if you're hip. By the way, borrowed from old Protestant liberalism, if you go back a little ways and see where that came from. We're incarnational. Deeds, not creeds. Not only that, preach the gospel at all times, and if necessary, use words. Now, I'm so thankful for your response, and I'm thankful that you're uh, theologians and theologically minded, and you could probably give the lecture from here on out, but I'm going to go ahead and try to do a good job anyway. What's wrong with that? What's wrong with that? We do want to be sincere. We do want to be incarnational in the sense that we want to show people the love of Christ. Please don't misunderstand. I'm trying to use a little shock value. We don't want to just have creeds and no deeds. Okay, but what's wrong with preach the gospel at all times and if necessary, use words? If you have a Bible, I'll invite you to turn to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10 is super helpful when it comes to this. And as you're turning there, I'll just suggest to you that the problem with it on one level is that the gospel men can't be lived by anyone other than the Lord Jesus Christ. You can't live the gospel. You can't do it. I can't live the gospel. It's impossible. Because gospel means good news. Okay? If we preach the gospel, we're telling good news. You don't live news. I suppose if you wanted to play word games, you could say you do. But really, we don't, we don't live news. Look at Romans chapter 10, verse 14. Romans 10, 14. God, uh, good news is to be proclaimed, not lived. How then will they call on Him, Jesus that is, in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in, believe in Him on who, of whom they have not believed? or never heard. Notice the emphasis on heard. And how are they to hear without someone preaching, heralding, proclaiming? Verse 15. And how are they to preach, notice, unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach good news. You can't live the news. You could watch the news or hear of the news. But if you're the one Giving the news, you can't live it. You tell of it. You proclaim it, especially if it's good news. Imagine with me, if you would, a newscaster. What does a newscaster do? Does a newscaster watch the event that happens, and then all of a sudden, with you watching on your television, live it out? Do they mime it? You know, do all this kind of crazy stuff, and you're going, what is that? That, that is not what they do. It's silly. Now my head hurts. <laughs> they, don't, they don't do that. It's ridiculous. That's why I wanted it to stick in your mind. What they do is they tell you about what happened. And they might tell you the meaning and the significance about what happened. Live, on the scene, at 11, here's what just happened. Well, that's what happens with news and newscasters. Our news is, let us tell you about what happened one Friday afternoon outside of the city gates in Israel, in the Middle East. We, it's historic. It's something that really happened. And, and we tell not only what happened, we tell the meaning of what happened. Preach the gospel at all times. If necessary, use words. You, you, you can't preach the gospel without words. It can't be done. It's preaching, proclaiming, heralding. It's true we want to live differently. We're salt and light, as Jesus says. We don't want to be a contradiction to what we're proclaiming. But it's so crucial that we see those verses, even verse 17. So faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. 
Back when that was written, there were people living certain ways that were commendable and certain ways that weren't commendable. Human nature hasn't changed. But the text says what's most important, faith comes by hearing. And hearing the word of Christ, the gospel. We've got to remember that. Furthermore, this isn't a good model for evangelism. It's a problematic on another level. It's problematic because I'm a sinner. And so are you. So how can I live the gospel? How can I preach the gospel with my life? Let me be really blunt. The gospel you preach with your life is anti-gospel. The gospel you preach with your, with your life is a perversion of the gospel. Right? Because you're a sinner. And so am I. The only one who could ever live the gospel is Jesus Christ. So we don't point people to ourselves. We point people to Him. The good one. And we tell good news about the good one. It has to be that way. It has to be that way. And you say, what about the Holy Spirit transforming my life? And that's all good, right, and true. I think Paul had the Holy Spirit working in his life. But even if you had a bumper crop of fruit going on in your life, hopefully you wouldn't be so audacious as to disagree with the Apostle Paul, who himself would say in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15, I am the foremost of sinners. I think he had the Spirit of God indwelling him, and he was producing fruit. And he's still saying, I'm, the, I'm chief of sinners. So he didn't preach himself, he preached Christ. Don't preach yourself. And that brings us to a further problem when it comes to this. And it reminds me of 2 Corinthians when Paul's talking about, I think, this very kind of matter. How about turning to 2 Corinthians chapter 4? If I'm going to preach the gospel without words, then I'm not going to really be telling about the true Jesus. I'm going to be telling you more about who than the true Jesus. The person I like to talk about most in my flesh. So. <laughs> I'm going to be talking about myself, right? <clears throat> if I preach the gospel with my life and tell stories about me, 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 look at me, 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 I'm telling, I'm talking about myself. Instead of acknowledging I'm a sinner, don't look to me. Look to Christ. Good news, hope in Him. This is why I think 2 Corinthians chapter 4 is helpful. If you just drop down to, maybe let's start um, down in verse 5. I mean, this, it'll produce popularity if you, if you just live the gospel, which you can't really do. But you'll become popular and you'll be cool because you're a great example, at least from what people can see. But how about verse 5? For what we proclaim is not ourselves. I would suggest to you when we say we live the gospel, we are proclaiming ourselves. He says we don't proclaim ourselves, but Jesus Christ. Notice it's proclaiming Jesus Christ as Lord. How about verse 7? We have this treasure in jars of clay. That's a good self-describer. To show the surpassing power belongs to God, not to us. We don't want to preach our toilet selves without words. We're going to open our mouths and have everybody know. When I'm doing a Bible study last week with my unbelieving friends, I want to point them to the righteousness of Christ and hope in Him and acknowledge before them that, that, that I'm broken and that I'm a sinner and boast in Christ. Because even if they think I'm all that, in time they're going to figure out I'm not. And they're going to find out you're not either. Hope is outside of you. It's in Christ. Well, we're not going to take the time to, to go there, but even the opening verses of chapter 4 are so helpful when it comes to we're not um, preaching ourselves and, and cunning uh, and, and tampering with God's Word. I would suggest to you that when we say we're preaching uh, uh, without preaching, we're, we're tampering. We're not being honest. The good news is meant to be proclaimed. It's meant to be preached. So the glory goes to not us, but to Christ. And I want to be better at preaching and proclaiming and not pointing to me. Maybe just a show of hands, just to kind of take the temperature here. Um, how many of you think you've sinned enough today to go to hell? Yeah. Hello, my name is Pat. <laughs> right? I'm glad we're having this recovery meeting. <laughs> See? Hello, my name is Pat, and I have a problem. I'm so glad. By the way, 
But one of the last times I did that at Omaha Bible Church, I was shocked at how many people wouldn't put their hand up. One person sticks out of my mind and just sat there and shook their head. Think about it. If God's requirement, standard, is to love him with your heart, soul, mind, and strength, to love him with all of your faculties, with, including, including motive, that all, all that you are uh, is, is given toward that. I would suggest to you that none of us in this room have ever done that perfectly, completely, for one second. Preach the gospel with your life? No, let's preach Christ. Let's preach Christ. Hope is in Him. Hope is in us. Now, again, please don't misunderstand. We want to live, uh, I, I, I want to live in a way that glorifies Christ. I want to have, bear fruit in my life that complements, not contradicts. But until we see Christ, right, we won't be made like Him. We're waiting for glorification. We know it's locked in. It's going to happen in light of what Romans says in Romans chapter 8. But, but we're, we're living in that, that time when it's not a f fully realized. So let's preach Christ. Not ourselves. Let's move to another gospel misstep, and that would be gospel illiteracy. Gospel illiteracy. Mike mentioned earlier, and we're going to go to 1 Corinthians 15 uh, and, and look there if you'd like to turn there. Mike mentioned earlier that there, it's nice that there's a recovery of the gospel and lots of talk about the gospel. I heard the other day that there's a, there's a, there's a gospel study Bible. Uh, don't know anything about it, but there's a gospel study Bible, and we have gospel community groups, and we're gospel-centered and Christ-centered, and gospel, 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 gospel. I'm thankful for those things. I really am, and that movement, that recovering has definitely affected my life, and I'm super thankful. But we don't want it to just be rhetoric. That'd be a shame. What is the gospel? What is the gospel? It starts by knowing what it is. Well, we've already talked about that a little bit. Let me use a couple of case studies to kind of shock you out of the place that perhaps you're in. I was in Florida this summer. I was taking a class and just at night taking a break. I was going on a bike ride and I'm going by a super cool church. It looked, I was kind of church I'd want to have the building. Um, it was awesome looking and look cutting edge and like things are really happening. And ride my bike by the church and their church motto with a really cool sign was on the side of the, the building. It was clearly what they were all about. Okay, huge letters. Loving God, loving neighbor, slogan of the church. I think it was on the kiosk too. That was their theme. And what I said out loud was, Law Church. Law Church. Is that what you would have thought? Now maybe I'm out of line. You can correct me later. <laughs> <laughs> Law Church. Oh, Church of Legalism. I had a guy tell me last weekend, we had a conference at our church, and he told me, he said, you know, I just want to tell you, I don't really know him very well, he's a friend of a friend, I just want to tell you that for the last 15 years of my life, what I've been committed to, and the, 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 the slogan of my life, has been loving God and loving neighbor. It's been awesome. I said, oh, so you're really committed to the law. He looked at me like I was from another planet. Jesus summarizes the law as loving God with heart, soul, mind, and strength and loving your neighbor as yourself. Summary of the law. Law, church. How about that? Is the gospel loving God and loving neighbor? I don't think so. I don't think so. The gospel is the good news that the one who perfectly loved God and then perfectly loved neighbor did everything necessary, did it on our behalf because we're miserably failing at it all the time. And so should Bethlehem Bible Church be law church? What message do you have for this community? You have good news. 1 Corinthians 2.2 to know nothing among you except the law that condemns. 
Take that, Boston. Take that, New Hampshire. Take that, Rhode Island. <laughs> no. To know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. The law keeper treated as if he's the lawbreaker, which is good news for us so that we can have our law breaking atoned for. That's what it is. Now, please don't get me wrong. This is just a short kind of seminar. But, but yes, we do need to preach God's law because we need people to know that they're lawbreakers, that they're guilty. So, yeah, we do want to preach that to the surrounding community. But that's not what we're all about because we preach that law message so that we understand guilt. And then we preach the good news of the one who is none other than Christ. And then this is how the guy was at, at Omaha Bible Church last week, no doubt, as we talked further. Then in response, yes, we want to say, I, I, the law is good and righteous and holy, and I do want to love God because that's what's right. And I do want to love my neighbor because that's what's right. But we got to make sure we keep things in the right order or we're confused. I have a little five-year-old son. He, uh, strict orders. I said, Owen, you're not to talk at the dinner table when I'm talking to the teenagers about this. And we're reading that Kevin DeYoung book about the Heidelberg Catechism and the two little boys, no talking or mommy gives you a spanking. That's the way we catechize in our house. Because <laughs> I want to deal with the older kids. Get the younger ones to do something after on their level. Man, Owen is just dying to talk. Five-year-old sweet little boy. He wants to talk so badly because he knows the answer before the other kids know the answer. Because he knows the three G's. I want you to know the three G's. Guilt, grace, and gratitude is what Owen would tell you, right? We, the, the law of God shows us our guilt and, and, and then we have grace in the gospel and, and now we do want to do the law of God out of gratitude. But we've got to make sure we keep things in the right order, men, or we're very confused about what the gospel is. Very confused. I had to read a book recently for a class, an evangelism class. I had to read a whole bunch of books. I had to review a book. The book was called Evangelism, written by a guy that went to a credible conservative seminary that's fought battles for uh, the truth of the gospel no longer alive. Evangelism is the name of the book. I won't mention the author to protect the guilty. Never one time in the book, never one time did he state what the gospel is. But he was sure big to emphasize the fruit of the gospel and describe it as the gospel. First Corinthians chapter 15 is so helpful. You know it well, probably too well because then we're indifferent toward it. But let's just make sure we've got it stuck in our heads, men. Verse 3 says, For I delivered to you as of first importance. Everything's important in the Bible, right? But some things are marked, uh, starred. First importance, what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. It's crucial. And sometimes in the New Testament, a certain aspect is emphasized or a different aspect is emphasized or a different aspect is emphasized. But when you boil it all down, it has to do with the work of Christ. Perfectly keeping the law. Toning for rebellion, rising from the dead, and you get all of those things emphasized. We've got to know that. If I say, what's the gospel? I tell new people at Omaha Bible Church, I just want you to say, it's the good news about Jesus. And I say, you pass. Now we can go deeper than that. It's the good news about Jesus. It's the good news about his historic work. Here's a question for you. Is the gospel following Jesus? Is it good to follow Jesus? Yeah. You need the gospel because you're not good at following Jesus. By the way, out of gratitude, now you want to get good at following Jesus. <laughs> There's hope in that. We also have to remember the gospel isn't the response. What's the right response to the gospel? 
We heard it earlier in, in, in Romans chapter 1, verse 16. You believe, you trust, it's the right response. And we do call people to respond once we tell them what the gospel is. Once we tell them what that is. Let's move on to another one. Let's move to another gospel, abusive gospel misstep. Are we in number four? Okay. How are we doing? We're doing great. I'm having fun. Glad you guys came just to watch me have fun doing this. I would do this at my house if you guys weren't here. This is like, this is where it's at. Number four, another abusive gospel misstep would be Christians are to redeem culture. Christians are to redeem culture. How many, and by the way, those of you who go to this church, I'm saying a lot of things that your pastor would never dare say, right? <laughs> Two peas in a pod, I'm afraid. So if you're thinking, would you bring a different guest speaker next time? Because I don't want just the same stuff that Mike teaches and believes. Um, I guess that's just how, how it goes. So I'm so thankful for for that and good fellowship. Number four, Christians are to redeem culture. It's a big one, big one in circles I run in and big one if you wanna be accepted um, and relevant um, and cool and recognized and affirmed and published. Why are we here? We gotta redeem culture, we gotta transform culture. Just a simple question for you. In, in the Bible, when the New Testament talks about redemption, where's the, where's the focus? Jesus redeems what? Sinners. Sinners. That's the focus for sure. That's the focus for sure. And by the way, also, if you want to turn to Galatians chapter 3, we'll see it. I'm also going to read Titus chapter 2. Another thing that's important about this is it doesn't speak, the New Testament doesn't speak in terms of something that's left undone. Jesus is redeeming. That's not the emphasis. It's on a different syllable, okay? It's not redeeming. It's what? It's past. It's redeem. Duh. <laughs> it's almost like we used to go, duh. He redeemed. He's not redeeming when it comes to sinners who, is the, who are the focus. How about Galatians 3.13? Just a sample. Christ redeemed us. Work done. Work completed. And it's the us emphasized from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. Titus chapter 2, verse 13, our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us. Finality, completion, done. Historic work. He came here, he did it, and he ascended and sent his spirit. And he will come again one day. But notice the two major points. He redeemed, completed action. And notice also that it's not about a culture that's being redeemed or cultures. It's about a people. We've got to remember that. It's almost like we've just lost our minds. Just think simply. Think biblically. What's the gospel? It's the good news about how Jesus is redeeming culture. We could pack the place out if we would have talked like that in promoting this. You men have a great opportunity to speak the truth lovingly about the clarity and what the clarity of the gospel is. Listen to this. This is a quotation from um, a, a writer who, who has a published article in a theological journal. Um, conservative, Bible-believing theological journal. And I quote, how would you critique this or how would you affirm this or not? In short, the Great Commission is the announcement of the good news that Christ has made it possible for us to take up once again humanity's cultural mandate. I got a sad look on my face for that one. In short, the Great Commission is the announcement that the good, of the good news that Christ has made it possible for us to take up once again humanity's cultural mandate. That's problematic on so many fronts. It's 
It's a huge problem. Christ made it possible. And now what, we're going to take up the cultural mandate? It has major issues. It's a major issue because he didn't make things possible. The gospel is the good news about Christ's finished work, right? It's problematic on another level because it devalues the work of Christ. Who was given the cultural mandate, by the way, back in Genesis? Adam was given the cultural mandate. And who is going to fulfill the cultural mandate? Us? Well, maybe in a certain sense, we want to act like human beings and, and we want to do that. But according to the scriptures, the ultimate fulfiller, the true, genuine fulfiller of the cultural mandate is it's Jesus. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 45 refers to him as the second Adam, the last Adam. So the first Adam doesn't do it. He fails. And so what, what do we do? We pick up where he left off. That's the good news. We don't pick up where he left off. The good news is one would come who did what he didn't do on our behalf. There's a reason why it's called the last Adam. Jesus fulfilled that. He fulfilled everything necessary. And if we get that confused, it's not very long. And it's no wonder so many of these people do. Super important. It's not very long though, where we start losing sight of even things like justification by faith alone. And that's where the drift goes. Adam failed. Last Adam succeeded. The good news isn't that we pick up where our first Adam left off. How tragic. The good news is the last Adam did it all perfectly. And we live in light of the gospel. We live in light of that. This is good. This is positive. This is right. The first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. So good to know and to understand this. Doesn't mean we don't try to do anything to impact our world. We obviously do. Jesus said we shouldn't be salt and light. He said we are salt and light. Obviously, we want to make a difference where we live and breathe and have our being and bring glory to Christ. But it's not that big weight hanging around your neck that you better fulfill the cultural mandate. Well, you're living in gratitude toward the one who did fulfill the cultural mandate perfectly, and his name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. This could take us in a million different rabbit trails, but let's just think of one illustration here. Let's just think for a minute if we're going to really, okay, what we need to do is, is transform the culture and re-pick re up where the first Adam left off. And what we need to do is, is have truth and, and justice and righteousness, specifically God's word. And, and, and it's going to be what takes over the culture and takes over the society. And it's going to change everything. And what we need to have is a thoroughgoing Christian nation following Christian ethics. By the way, I'm all for righteousness. And I'm all for being salt and light. Don't misunderstand. But if we're really going to, we're going we're gonna, to, we're going to bring the two together. If you could do that, would you really want to do that? Bring church and state together. Well, that was an experiment that didn't go so well the last time it happened. We're all embarrassed by things like crusades. By the way, we should be. I mean, just think about it. What's the, what's the Christian ethic when someone insults you, they strike you on the cheek, what do you do? Yeah. Thank you, sir. May I have another? What's Romans 13 say about the government, the culture at large, the outside unbelieving culture? Established by God. And uh, when something bad happens, the police should turn the other cheek. Not last time I checked. Last time I checked, that shotgun in that policeman's car isn't for decoration. That's the, the New Pat translation of the New Testament. <laughs> the contemporary version. It says, they don't bear the sword for nothing. Justice. The church is not, the Christian ethic isn't that. Turn the other cheek. There's something to think about different 
Now, that, again, that doesn't mean we don't want to make an influence and we don't want to have good things happen. We do. We have to remember that we're called to preach the gospel, and the gospel isn't about transforming culture. And by the way, Jesus, when he comes back, will transform the culture. Okay? Let's not be functional post-millennialists. Okay? Let's not do that. He'll transform the culture all right. Let's remember he's coming again, and he'll destroy the earth and recreate it. All right, let's move on. I think we probably have time to at least do one more of these. Uh, abusive gospel misstep number five. The Bible is a book of timeless truths for living. The Bible is a book of timeless truths for living. Now, that could be true. But that's not the best way to describe what the Bible is all about. It's not the best way. Because if that's the best way, we sound a lot like old Protestant liberals who denied the gospel. You know what they wanted to talk about all the time a hundred years ago? Even in some of these parts? Come to our church because the Bible is relevant to your daily life. We will give you practical truths, timeless truths, and you can come and be a better dad or a better mom. That's taken one right out of the playbook of old Protestant liberalism that people like Jay Gresham Machen had to stand up against in the days of Princeton's demise theologically. Here's a helpful quote by Mike Horton regarding this. Whenever the story of David and Goliath is used to motivate you to think about the Goliaths in your life and the seven stones of victory used to defeat them, You've been a victim of moralistic preaching. The same is true whenever the primary intention of the sermon is to give you a Bible hero to emulate or a villain to teach a lesson like crime doesn't pay or sin doesn't really make you happy. Reading or hearing the Bible in this way turns the scriptures into a sort of Aesop's fables or Grimm's fairy tales where the story exists for the purpose of teaching a lesson to the wise. And the story ends with, and they lived happily ever after. In his screw tape letters, Lewis has screw tape writing Wormwood in the attempt to persuade Wormwood to undermine the faith by turning Jesus into a great hero and moralist. And how many times are we maybe guilty of doing that with the Bible? Not being very well aware of history and, and who's done that before us. We're in bad company. And then we go to the New Testament and it seems to be all the more tragic. How many times do we go to the New Testament and, and we think, well, the, the New Testament is, well, I'm, I'm preaching through the Gospels. Surely I'm going to get the Gospel right in the Gospels. Um, remember when Jesus was tempted? Matthew chapter 4, I think, off the top of my head in the Matthew account. What's the point of the sermon? What's the point of your lesson with the little boys and little girls? Is the point, Jesus quotes Scripture. We should quote scripture too. Be like Jesus. Now, is it true that Jesus quotes scripture? It's true. Should we know the Bible and hide it in our hearts? Absolutely. How can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping according to your word? Ab absolutely. Primary emphasis, primary point in Matthew's gospel account? Not on your life. Not in your life. What's the whole, whole thing about? I, I, I love it that in Matthew chapter 1, we're given a heads up. We're given a flag that's waved. Let me tell you what this whole thing is about. Matthew chapter 1, I think it's in verse 23. It could be 21. I think 23. That you, should, you should call his name Jesus. Why? Because he will save his people from their sins. Not So he will show them how to quote Bible verses. And they, can, they too can overcome temptation. The problem is we don't overcome temptation. The problem is we need him to save us from our sins. What's the whole story ultimately about, even though we can find practical things along the way? He tells us. He tells us. We have to remember that. We have to remember that. And remember the big picture, the authorial intent sometimes we like to say. Well, it's certainly the case there. Verse 21, by the way. I need to stick to my notes. And then you think in terms of, what about that chapter 4? You're thinking more holistically. You're thinking big picture. You're remembering other things you know from Scripture, like I just referenced in 1 Corinthians 15, that he's the last Adam. 
Oh, let's have a good, thoroughgoing, two-atom theology. Understand the Bible better. Who was tempted by Satan? Who succumbed to the temptation? Who was tempted by Satan? Who didn't succumb to the temptation? First Adam, last Adam. So instead of saying there are good moral principles here, that's the main point. Instead, we're saying praise be to God that we have a great representative in the last Adam and he didn't drive the car into the spiritual ditch like the first one did, right? This is good news. Secondary application, gratitude application, if you will. We do want to quote scripture and we do want to overcome temptation and, 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 and we now have the power to do that. You see the difference? It's not a slight difference. It's an important difference. It's a crucial indifference. It's vital. I mentioned the Protestant liberalism thing earlier, and I think it's probably worth referencing, quoting Machen here on this. This is his, from his book on the virgin birth, which everyone has on their shelf of their pastor and nobody's read. It's kind of how the story goes because it's so hard to read. This quote isn't hard to read. And just think about how, how relevant I should use that word, shouldn't I? Think about how relevant this is to where we are. J. Gresham Machen, writing this in, it's published in 1932. It seems never to have occurred to the adherents of this religion, it's the imitation of Jesus' religion, that there is such a thing as sin. And that sin places an awful gulf between man and God. But those convictions, though they are unpopular at the present time, are certainly quite central in the Christian religion. From the beginning, Christianity was the religion of the broken heart. It is based upon the conviction that there is an awful gulf between man and God, which none but God can bridge. Of what avail, without the redeeming acts of God, are the lofty ideals of psalmists and prophets, all the teaching and example of Jesus. In themselves, he says, they can bring us nothing but despair. We Christians are not interested merely in what God commands, but also in what God did. And then he ends the quote, I'll end the quotation here, in a triumphant indicative. Like Christ died for our sins not you need to try more and do harder to be the man you need to be see the huge difference it's huge and just as it was a big deal then it's a big deal now the bible is so relevant and it is but we have to remember that it's relevant first and foremost because there's a great drama explained that we call the drama of redemption. And Jesus didn't come here to be merely an example because he went to Calvary. He fulfilled the law, did everything necessary. It's about him and boasting in him. Mike likes to say this, I like to say it as well. We're not going to get to heaven someday and somehow say we did it. Knuckles. It's not going to happen. I did a great job following Daniel. I did a great job following David. I did a great job following Jesus, trump card. No. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Oh, yes, because of the Lamb, we were given the Spirit, and the Spirit produces fruit in us, and we want to bear fruit, absolutely, out of gratitude. But we've got to get things in the right order in the correct order. I can't tell you how many commentaries that seem otherwise so good that I read as a pastor and you, you men who are teaching somebody in your life and consult these commentaries and they're helpful on so many things. And before you know it, it's all about emulation, example following, forgetting the big picture and what it's all about. Be on your guard. Be on your guard to remember who the hero is. How about this? Be on your guard to make sure you think and worship and teach and talk like a Christian. 
in Christianity first and foremost is a religion committed to the central reality symbolized in that cross right there. What Christ did. What Christ did. There are so many missteps. History is repeating itself. We want to not make those missteps. Not so we can make a name for ourselves, but so that we can boast and help others to boast in the one and only one in whom we should boast, right? Christ and Christ and Christ and Christ. Tell me more about Christ. Tell me more about Him. That's what we want to do. The good news of salvation in Christ. Let's pray and we'll end. Father, thank you for your glorious and